side of the ship and I see about 50 dolphins, a whole pod of dolphins that were jumping beside the ship. And so field research, I put it on my time card. And I also think though that I summoned them. That sounds about right also, yeah. After that I said, I haven't seen any giant squids yet and it hasn't happened on any of those cruise ships, but maybe in the canal. It's murky down there, we don't know. So look at this, he's started out with a blob of glass and he's already changed the profile quite a bit. He flattened out a section I want you to pay attention to the tool in his hands. He used that a lot when he was making the mug. That's the tool called the jacks, and it's a Swiss Army knife, really, for glass blowing. So many different applications. But pay attention to the different ways that he uses it. You know, he can glide the blades along the mass of glass to sculpt it, to contour it. And right now, he's starting to make a little partition in that flattened section. Is anyone guessing, like, the orientation of our dolphin yet? Right? The crowd got excited because Dane broke glass where he meant to. <laughs> yeah, so he created a score mark with the uh, jacks, he tapped on that, the vibration travels into the glass, it finds the weak spot of the partition and it broke there. But now we have the beginning of our dolphin tail, okay? Catherine, you're doing a great job. <laughs> Babysitting our wave. Isn't that beautiful? Now, right where the crest the wave is connected to the steel rod. You know, the connection point there is only about the size of a dime. And it's a connection that went on pretty cold because it's designed to be temporary and you want to break and release it right there later on. So what that means is that it's incredibly precarious. If Catherine were to bonk the end of the steel against the table here, just like how when Dane tapped the end of the dolphin tail, it caused the glass to break, well, that vibration would travel to the connection between the wave and the punty and it would separate it. And so. You know, she's very gentle with her movements. Ooh, good dolphin tail, Bane. That almost looks like a mermaid tail right now. <laughs> One of my favorite creatures that I've ever sculpted is, um, you might have heard of it. It's a, it's a mythological creature, but it sails around or travels around Alaska. It's the uh, merjack, which is half mermaid or half fish and half Alaskan lumberjack. And so it's got you know, a big burly chest and suspenders, usually an ax and a beard, and then a beautiful dolphin tail. So, you know, Dana, if you change your mind, we haven't seen a merjack make his way down the canal, but I think they could. You know, Mike, Mike, and Mike over here from uh, the canal system, they've got so much great information, but they were talking about how, you know, this Erie Canal connects us to everything. You know, we can travel to New York City, we can travel up to Canada. So I'm sure. There, swimming around here. Is this the show? Is this for sale? I wish it was, right? I would collect this glass in a heartbeat, but we're from the Corning Museum of Glass and we are here to educate you about glass. Our mission is to tell the world about glass. And so we're not here to sell you stuff. So everything that we make um, eventually, you know, finds new homes, but it's often donated to different charitable organizations. And uh, yeah, we, we just don't retail the glass, which is really fantastic for us as artists. Because if the word got out that, you know, the glass blowers from Corning are here and they're, they're making and selling stuff, we would have a very different show. Okay. You guys like blue vases? Everyone likes blue vases. What you would see is us working on, you know, morning to night, nonstop in assembly line fashion, trying to crank out as many blue vases as we can to feed the retail monster that gets created. Because we're good at what we're doing in the future. Well, when we do this to teach you about class, it's very different. We really get to slow down. We get to make weird stuff like merjacks or dolphins Not like or, you know, like a things that we're inspired by. We get to approach this as artists and it's really fantastic. Love that we have that policy. And you know, you can still cross it if it took. We do have a really they good gift shop at the glass market. Up. And actually, I want to let you guys know. And so, we want you to come and see us in Corning. We have a glass market there where actually Dave and Catherine have glass for sale. Lots of local artists have glass for sale. But we have glass from all over the globe for sale at our glass market. All right, so it looks like we're about to have a big transition here. We're gonna, are we gonna attach this to the wave now, Dane? Okay, 
Okay, Catherine's task is almost finished where she gets to hand this back off because what we're going to do is stick the dolphin onto the wave and then once it's attached there, Dane can start to shape the face of our dolphin and all the appendages, all the body parts. So look at that, you got it good and hot, laying it down, stretching the tail. And now we're going to break it free. I totally did not have a poker face. I like covering my, like clutching my face and my mouth as they do that transition because, you know, that was some thick glass where the dolphin nose was attached to Dane's piece of steel. And we had to worry because when Dane had to really bonk his iron to break it free right there, well, all those other precarious connection points, like where the bottom of the wave is connected to the punty, that could have broken. And so I was just kind of holding my breath, crossing my fingers, thinking good thoughts that it would break exactly the way that we just saw it happen. And so now, Dane, he's going to be able to heat up what will become the nose of the dolphin. Glass. And still a, a precarious situation because we want to heat up that uh, kind of upper body. I need to work on my dolphin body parts. That they don't have torso, really, do they? I don't know. <laughs> this part of the dolphin. He's going to get that nice and hot. And then he wants to start to stretch it out. But he doesn't want to overheat that wave. He doesn't want to overheat the tail because that needs to be stiff and stable. Periodically though, we do see him what we call flash the glass. The entire piece top to bottom goes deep inside that furnace. We want to make sure that nothing gets too cold. Now this is a, a really unique shop that we get to work out of. It's all electric. And it's really unusual. You know, historically, you know, when they first started blowing glass, we had wood fires to, to get the furnaces nice and hot, wood and bellows and a lot of labor and manpower to make that happen. Natural gas or propane that they were there. And when we first started flowing glass on the ships, you know, they said, well, you can't have any open flames. And a lot of people said, well, then you can't have glass blowers. But we've got a, a fantastic fearless leader over here, Mr. Steve Gibbs. And he said, you know, I think we can do it. And so he actually holds the patent with a furnace builder out in Washington. Do. But together, they created the world's first all What's electric up? glass blowing studio. So as far as I know, there's only five, six furnaces like this okay. in the world. Three are on our ships. One is at our museum that we used to train our glass blowers, and of course one is here now on the Erie Canal. So this is I know. very fancy. Can you see the electrical elements? Where I'm standing, I can see them. So it's got elements inside. So really, it's like a great big toaster oven. Oh, okay, jeez, you said 4.30, and so kind of now we're getting here. And the elements, they're made of something called molybdenum disilicide. Really okay, but you, you originally, else about you originally said five. Right, but I can pronounce it, and that was an accomplishment. Yeah, but what's interesting about working out of this four, is that if we were four, on land and our furnace was fueled four. by gas, yeah. we would turn it's it off fine. at the end of the day, turn it back on in the morning, an hour later, you have 2,000 degrees of heat. Okay, well, these I'm sorry. elements, when they are cooling, they go through a vulnerable state where they're very brittle at certain temperatures. It makes cool below a certain temperature threshold. No, I'm and so we just turn it up. down. I'm just and sorry, I don't turn it off completely. And if we did start cold and heat it all the way up like we have to periodically, it takes hours and hours. It's going to take me a little while because I'm down, early, I'm so down near the canal. This has been on since Wednesday. And we'll stay on for the duration. Look at this. Did you guys see yeah. how the dolphin face is starting to emerge from right. that Bye. edge of broken glass? Now you are watching a master glass blower when you see something like this happen because he had to have the perfect heat kind of uh, worked into the shoulders of the dolphin. Again, dolphin body parts are hard, but into the, the shoulders of the dolphin, the neck of the dolphin. He had to have all that heat worked down so that he could pinch and pull it and not only create the nose of the dolphin, but the profile of the entire face and how it tapers down just beautifully. And I think that is perfect, right? Oh, and he even made a little blow hole. Oh. Alright, we got a problem though, right? This dolphin wouldn't swim as elegantly as some others. We need to add the um, arm fins and the hair fins. I don't Steve, do you know do you know the dolphin the dorsal, right? Dorsal fin and pectoral fins. So those are the body parts coming next. 
I'm much better with like fluffy animals. I can, I know arms, legs, ears, those kinds of things come quite naturally to me. And so more teamwork is required. Jeff has gathered up some glass. He's rolled it in the same color blue as our dolphin. We call this bit working. Anytime someone presents glass to the guy, we say that's a bit of glass. And Dane is communicating with Jeff about how much glass he needs, the scale, the size. I was working with Jeff earlier. Jeff made a really cool dinosaur earlier in the day and I was helping him out. And at one point Jeff says, okay, I need to add my T-Rex legs and I'm gonna need two bits of glass and I need it to be about the size of your thumb. And I was like, cool, I got it, size of my thumb. And he's like, wait, wait, wait. I need it to be about the size of Dane's thumb. <laughs> that my, my thumb was not right. And so we had to make a quick adjustment, but you know, that's the type of kind of on the fly communication that we have between artists working here in the studio. Oh. And so there's artists who use different analogies. Body parts are a good one because you got a ready visual that you can start to reference. I don't think so, but we'll see. We use sporting goods. You know, I need a bit of glass that's about the size of a ping pong ball. Okay, I know what you're talking about. And so, a little handoff here. This little bit of glass, Dane's gonna make a construction it that the connection on the back of the dolphin is nice and skinny. You know, you can do the same thing where you take a blob of glass, you stick it on the dolphin and then you flatten it, but then you get um, the, the squish at the bottom. You can see it kind of splayed out right there. But Dane is a very clean, very technical glass blower, so he wants to make sure that it's nice and skinny from the get-go. And I see more and more people over here in the wings. If you can make your way up under the tent, we've got more room in the back. We've got awesome AV team who have uh, got close-up shots from our video monitors up here in the rafters. Look at that, sticks it right down. He had great heat from Jeff, stretched it, cut it, beautiful dorsal fin. All right, so now the pectoral fins. I gotta tell you, when you're learning to sculpt creatures, a fish is kind of a common thing that you might learn how to make there. Um, a great exercise in adding different bits and body parts to your, your creatures, great way to learn how to sculpt. But a common phenomenon is that if you're learning how to sculpt fish, you're only gonna make Nemo fish. You guys know about Nemo? So it has nothing to do with like the color or um, species of fish. It has everything to do with the fins, right? Nemo is known for being this adorable little fish with one great big fin and one little tiny one, right? Which is a cute story and you can charge more for that if you sell the story. But as a glass maker, really, we're going for symmetry, okay? So Dane, he's got to add two of these fins and, you know, he doesn't want to make Nemo the dolphin. So the pressure's on. I like to say, don't blow it. Thank you for the three people who left. <laughs> What you doing there? What's this bit? This is going to be the first pectoral fin. So again, the same maneuver where Dane's going to take that little bit of glass, he's going to flatten it, he's going to give it the profile, and then do a little bit more of a handoff. And well, it would be awesome if we could just set the dolphin down, keep it in one place, and return to it. Jeff has to take this turn where they're babysitting, they're doing these handoffs. And something else to notice, every time Jeff or Dane sit down at the bench with the dolphin or when they move the dolphin back to the reheating furnace, notice how gently they lay it down on the bench. You know, they're laying steel against steel when the, you know, um, hunty touches the bench rail, but you don't hear it because if they were to touch it down or set it down with any kind of vibration, with the, any kind of force that would make a noise, that would be enough to also break the glass. Oh, careful step in here. And so look at that, we stuck it, we stretched it. Beautiful little fin. Now, it gets cuter and cuter as we add more body parts, right? The little arms, little gesture. But the pressure's on, okay? Because so now that we have one arm, we have to add another one that matches. And it's not even that you can make an identical arm, it has to be the mirror image of the other one. And so even the way that he has to stick it and stretch it on the opposite side of the dolphin body, 
means that he has to adjust the way that he moves with it. So anytime he makes these adjustments too with the overall um, kind of profile of the sculpture, the way it's situated on the crest of the wave, he's thinking about the center of gravity. You know, we want this to be a, a sculpture that's going to stand up beautifully on whatever surface it ends up living on. And he's doing that with a wooden paddle mostly. You know, when he's touching a section of the glass that's at a lower temperature, he doesn't want to touch it with metal, he doesn't want to touch it with graphite. We want to use wood that it doesn't cool it and crack it. And the further we get into this process, you know, I'm also starting to get a little bit stressed out because we have this very dainty, skinny dolphin nose. We have this very dainty dorsal fin, right? The ponytail fin. We've got these two pectoral fins, or well, one, almost two pectoral fins. And what that means is that all these little skinny appendages of glass, they're thin, they don't have a lot of thermal mass, and they've got all this wind and breeze circulating around them. So that means they're cooling really fast. They're, they're fragile. And so we always add the, the daintiest parts, the appendages, at the very end. You know, we're not going to do that too early, just because the longer they have to be out here in the ambient temperature, the more vulnerable this becomes. Look at that second fin, beautiful. Now even as when he stuck that down, you might have noticed he had it, um, the, the fin that was already attached was sitting straight up. He rotated it 180 degrees and that way he was already aligned to add the second fin on the opposite side of the body. And so Dane says, this is it. That was the final fin. Did you guys love it? It's perfect. Yeah. I love it. So we have a pretty big design flaw though with our Erie Canal Dolphin, and that's the ugly metal rod that it's attached to, right? So what we need to do is break it free. So Jeff, he's got his Saturday night outfit on, right? He's got his big Kevlar mittens. That means that he can grab on to the 900 or 1000 degree dolphin and safely load it into the 900 degree oven. And Dane, he's going to make sure that he's got a good amount of heat in the entire object from top to bottom. He wants to make sure all those fins are nice and warm so that when Jeff touches them with the gloves, the gloves won't immediately cool and crack them. You know, this, what we're trying to avoid is yeah, thermal shock. And the thermal shock that you're probably familiar with is if you pour room temperature soda over ice cubes and the ice cubes crack from the sudden temperature change, that's what we're avoiding. So taking these flashes of heat, trying to make sure that the top, the bottom, the fins, everything is good and warm, so that Dane can then very selectively cool the connection point between the punty and the bottom of the wave. If that's the cold spot, then everything will go as planned. You might even see Jeff uh, preheated the gloves. You know, we keep those gloves sitting on top of an oven so they're way hotter than the temperature of any other surface out here. Look at the angle that he's holding the steel. We want that water to run away. If it dripped onto the base itself, we'd have a broken wave, broken heart. Perfect. Absolutely stunning. So quickly, right into the oven. That's going to spend all night cooling down. So we won't get to see it again until tomorrow. But let's have a huge round of applause for your gaffer, Dane Jack. Catherine Ayers on the assist. Jeff Mack on the assist. And, you know, on top of that, we want to say thank you to everyone here. Making this festival, Museum. Fantastic right, event. This is our first time at